If you've been going around the good old internet looking for the right podcast to fulfill your New York Yankees needs, well, I'll be the first to deliver the good news to you. You have found it. Here on Yapping Yankees with me, your host, Mike Scudero, you and I will be discussing the latest news, takes, and talk throughout the entire Yankee universe. Oh, and there may be some ranting on my behalf. Yeah. Anyway, what do you say we get to it? Let's get to yapping! Well, hello there, my fellow Yankee fans, and welcome to episode 196 of the Yapping Yankees podcast, where we yap about the Yanks and nothing but those Yanks. As always, I am your host, Mike Scudero, here on the 24th day of September in 2023. Well, my friends, it's only appropriate that this weekend is a washout in the sense that in New York, it has been raining nonstop since the literal moment the weekend began and has not even stopped for a single second. I mean, you saw conditions yourself if you watched even a minute of today's game. Yesterday got rained out, but if you saw even a minute of today, you know how it looks in New York weather-wise. Which, today's weather, and speaking of today's game, poetically summed up the majority of the 2023 season filled to the brim with gutless and heartless efforts. Had another today, and true to today's conditions and this year's team, it represented something even greater than all the other instances, countless instances, that days like today took place. With today's loss, guys, the Yankees, for the first time, since 2016, and only the fifth time since, if you count 94 as a season, or not because of the strike, well, if not, then 93, I guess. Basically, 30 years is the point I'm trying to make. The Yankees have officially been eliminated from playoff contention. In a year that they were not only, as we know, expected to win the division, the American League East, but yet another that they were even expected to compete for and possibly even win a World Series, which, of course, they haven't even seen, let alone won, in 14 years now as that drought continues and sports odds and betters continue to look like absolute fools with their confidence in this team year in and year out. It's not the Yankees of old, guys. So maybe, just maybe, we ought to stop just betting that they're a championship team every single year, despite their many flaws. The old days are over with. Yeah, sure, no team's perfect. Definitely not. And although I openly said that I never thought, even before the season started, that they would win a title this year. Did I even have expectations for them? Yeah, I did. Even I did. I had them winning the division. Fairly easily, might I add. I don't know who remembers that, but I always own up to what I say. Also, ultimately failing at the main goal to follow, as they've become experts at doing for nearly a decade and a half now, but I had them winning the East, so expectations were still there. And I'll gladly hold the L on that, I guess. But not many of us at all, I don't care who you are, could have imagined that it would get so low that they even missed the playoffs. Even with an additional wildcard team being added into the format in just the last couple of years, makes it even worse. They're still even at plenty of risk at having their first losing season in over 30 years, finishing under 500. Group that with all of their dead last or near dead last offensive statistics as a team compared to any other throughout the entire league this year. And all things considered, what we have witnessed this season have been lows that many Yankee fans ever, let alone the ones my age, have ever had to deal with. I've been watching since late 2007, 16 years now basically, and I've seen the 08, 13, 14, 
and 16 teams missed the playoffs. But this team, statistically and mentally slash physically in every other way that matters, more fragile and incompetent than any of the others. And these other teams are ones that had guys like Vernon Wells, Kevin Euclid, Lyle Overbay, and some other names that some probably have no recollection of whatsoever, getting looks at batting cleanup. And somehow, even those teams managed to put up more fight and spirit than this one did. I mean, to say that there is much to be done this winter, and it's going to be a long one, is the understatement of the 21st century. And we've got plenty of time approaching to yap about all of it as we get into yet another off-season of Yapping Yankees episodes to come. So don't you worry. But the big idea today, more so than anything I've said, is that any playoff aspirations anyone had, and I unfortunately have not had any since early August before declaring the season over well over a month ago when I was in Italy still, even at that point, this team wasn't fooling me with any of their crap. Any playoff aspirations are done. Even mathematically now, finished. So to everyone out there, the optimists, who I respect and appreciate so long as you're not outlandish or toxic with it, and I delve into optimism plenty, and to my fellow realists who delve into both optimism and pessimism, if reason and logic provides clarity to do so, and even the pessimists themselves, Everyone, at ease. There's no sense in arguing or debating or disputing hope or lack thereof. Because even the math has made it definitive. The 2023 New York Yankees are done. Only a week left to go and all of it will basically just be for fun no longer has any meaning as far as this season is concerned. So, I guess let's just ride it out and try to have a half-decent time throughout. I don't really have any other choice. And again, I know this isn't something we usually deal with as Yankee fans. It's a tough pill to swallow, but it's the hand we've been dealt, my friends. But I do have one question. Over the years that I've been a Yankee fan, been on social media, been doing this show, every year the Yankees don't win the World Series. Even if they have a rockin' regular season, I've usually referred to each year that they don't win a title as a failure. And although many others who share my, I guess you could call it, Jeter-esque mentality a winner's mentality, especially when it comes to having high expectations for what was once the greatest franchise out there that will hopefully soon return to its former glory, would agree with me. Others would strongly disagree. You're ungrateful. You're spoiled. What the hell is wrong with you? They just won 90-whatever games and maybe even won the division, made it to the CS, DS, what have you. Okay, guys, fair enough. This year, they're barely going to finish at 500, if that. They're not making the playoffs. They're dead last or very close to it in damn near every offensive statistic known to man. Injuries show no sign of improving whatsoever. Quite the contrary, in fact. Therefore, affecting every aspect of the team on some level especially the rotation of late, which has experienced at least an injury at every moment of the entire season. Can't wait for that good old injuries excuse. Should I keep going? I think you get the idea. So now, tell me, are we allowed to finally call this one a failure? My fellow fans out there who love to gatekeep? 
Because I've got a few other words in mind, too, to describe what we've been most unfortunate witnesses to for the last six months, given the payroll, expectations, resources, so on and so forth for the Yankees. That's supposed to make them the New York Yankees, the feared, once respected New York Yankees. That's what makes this most frustrating. Could they be the Oakland A's or the Royals, teams that lose 100-plus more seasons than not, someone that low? Yeah, they absolutely could. And would that be even more miserable? Is it even more miserable for those fan bases? You'd have to ask them. But yeah, they could get that low, of course. Anyone can. But have we forgotten this is the Yankees we're talking about? Come on. It's not even a comparison. This was all a disgrace. Under, over, 500, don't care. I don't care. Disgrace. Nothing we haven't said for months now, especially those of us who have seen the writing on the wall for some time now. Maybe not since the first day of the season like some claim to, but for some time now. So ultimately, here we find ourselves at around 7 p.m., on September 24th, when most action around the league has wrapped up for the day to finish off the weekend, a Yankees season with high expectations sees its final week with no expectations. And that's basically all there is to it at this point, my good people. We are being witness to the fifth time in just about three decades, only five times, and we've been lucky for it. We have been but only the fifth time that we will not even see any October baseball out of the New York Yankees. At least not October baseball that means anything because they will have their final game of the season next Sunday, October 1st, but that's just the last day of the regular season means squat. I'm talking about postseason, meaningful baseball. That's it. I mean, what other spiel are we going to really go on? us Yankee fans about today. That's the biggest thing that happened. It's the only thing that really matters, at least in my mind. Someone who has that winning Jeter-esque mentality. I think playoffs, I think championships. And I have not even sniffed a World Series in nearly a decade and a half now, and I'm getting pretty damn hungry over here. Don't know about you. And like I said before, I know a lot of other people out there are pretty content with Seasons that they come up short as long as they win 95 to 100 games. Is it fun? Yeah. Do I give them credit? Yeah. Do I give them credit for the amount of years in a row they've been able to do that? More so than not? Yeah. But do I want to win another freaking World Series already too? Yeah. I do. Do I want to sniff another World Series? Yeah, I'd like to. But we're just getting further and further every year. Every year. And even in the years they do take a step forward, it usually ends with something just beyond embarrassing. The only year where they really took a convincing step forward from the year prior was 2019. You look at this window that's been open since 2017 when Judge had his first full rookie season and that was the team that got the closest to success more so than any other team in the last six, seven years since then. 2018... They lose to the Red Sox. 2019, they make some legitimate progress, get back to Game 6 of the CS, even though they lost a lot of games in that series, particularly at Yankee Stadium, that they should not have lost to the Astros. Really tough L's to take, and ultimately falling in Game 6 despite an epic late-game DJ home run. 2020, despite it being a messed-up season, get eliminated by another pretty big rival also in the division alongside the Red Sox, who they had lost to two years prior. Tampa Bay Rays, why not them next in Game 5 in San Diego? 2021, wild card game to your arch rival, Red Sox, again. They clean you up in a death match. 2022, last year, they get back to the championship series, so you say, okay, another step forward. Made it past the wild card again, made it all the way to the CS, get another shot against the Astros. You get completely and utterly humiliated. So is it really 
a step forward in any other way that matters other than actually getting back to the CS and physically being back into that round. And then the year after that, for the first time since before the Baby Bombers era, they don't even make the playoffs now. You'll get the excuses. You'll get the reasons. You'll get all the crap that they feed to the media, to the public on a regular basis. But just think about that for a second. About guys like Judge and Cole, the centerpieces of the team, continuing to age, not getting any younger. You're thinking about the window that's been open for years now. All the efforts they've tried to make to go to even greater strides than the very first team at the beginning of all this, the 2017 team, made. You have not gotten back to Game 7 of the American League Championship Series like that team did. You've not made it past that round. And you're only getting further from it. It's like every other year they make it to the championship series but still don't make it. It's really weird. 2017 championship series, 2018 lose to the Red Sox beforehand so you don't get as far. 2019 championship series, 2020 you lose before the CS again to the Rays. 2021 is a wild card game loss. So... Actually, two years in a row, you don't even make it to the championship series. 2022, last year, you make it back there, and they get absolutely embarrassed. And now this year, you don't even make the playoffs. This window is not going to be open forever. It's getting closer and closer to closing every year. Do the Yankees have more reinforcements and names joining them coming up, making the future a bit more bright? Yeah, probably. But the centerpieces of the team continue to age. Time continues to pass. Opportunities continue to be blown. There's only so many you're going to get. There's only so long it's going to last. That's just life. How many more chances? is this core going to get at winning a championship before they ultimately just completely and utterly fumble forever until that next group takes over? There's only so many chances you get. And now this year you've blown it in a worse way than any other year with this core. They've never even reached this low before to the point where they're not even going to be playing meaningful October baseball this year. To say it's humiliating embarrassing, shameful, disgraceful, think of any other word you want of that realm, doesn't quite describe it. Especially given what we come to expect of this team, the money put into it and the resources put into it, however poorly they're allocated into it, you just expect more. And of course, given the past and reputation of the organization, And we get nothing. At least not this year. So, I know the season isn't officially over until next Sunday. So, that's really when we should be putting a bow on this. But really in every way that matters, especially for us Yankee fans who expect infinitely more, especially after, you know, a decade and a half of starving here for a title or even just a look at a World Series which is approaching historic levels of its own, the pennant drought. But for those of us with that kind of mentality, the season isn't over next Sunday. The season ended today. This next week is meaningless, fun baseball. They're going to be playing a couple of teams that are in playoff races like the Blue Jays, and they're finishing up their series against the Diamondbacks tomorrow thanks to Saturday's game yesterday being rained out because this weekend has featured nothing but absolute crap weather. So, finishing off the D-backs who are in a playoff race, finishing off that series, and then playing the Blue Jays yet again at Rogers Center, like we spoke about last week, who are also in a playoff race. And then you finish off with the Cush series over in Kansas City against the Royals, who have over 100 losses already. Meaningless baseball. So I guess the only other goal playing-wise you could have, other than the couple that we've spoken about already with the continued development of the kids and 
ensuring that Garrett Cole gets that Cy Young and Judge continues to just hit homers out of the park and get at or as close to 40 as possible in just a little over 100 games, which is a hell of an achievement. I guess you just have to concentrate on just trying to beat the Diamondbacks tomorrow, messing up their playoff chances, and doing the same with the Blue Jays in Rogers Center. Not that it means anything for the Yankees, but we've spoken about for years now, and this trying to find the positive in basically virtually meaningless games. A part of that could be, which is what a lot of teams have done against the Yankees in the past when the Yankees have been in plenty of the playoff hunts that they've been in for a lot of years, is try to mess up their chances at getting a good playoff position or maybe even making it, period depending on how close they are to just clinching the very last spot that they have to make it. So, I guess you do that tomorrow with the D-backs, and you do that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with the Blue Jays. Next weekend, (laughs) do whatever the hell you want. No one's going to care. It's just fun at that point. Two teams who are not even making the playoffs finish off the season. Would have been a really nice final three games in a really hard-fighting playoff hunt if they were in it, My God, what a W that would have been for the Yankees to have to finish off with the Royals. What an advantage they would have had schedule-wise if they had a playoff race that happened to come down to the very last series. How great would that have been, huh? But we can't have nice things. We're not allowed to. So it's not even going to (laughs) matter. That's the way it goes. So listen, I don't mean to be overly dark or pessimistic or whatever word you want to use, but what else am I supposed to be? The Yankees were just eliminated from playoff contention today for the first time since 2016 and only the fifth time in about 30 years. So if you're going to be mad at me for starting out this show in a pessimistic tone, I don't really know what you want from me. So that's that, guys. So why don't we just move on because, you know, got some stuff to get through. I mean, a lot of my thoughts are just poured out in that intro, but we still got some stuff to cover. Got some stuff in the news that we should talk about pertaining to the Yankees. Recap this last week's action. Not that there is much to recap because not too much happened in the games. That's really worth talking about. Maybe just a couple of things. And then we'll finish off with the social media segment. That's how we do it. Next week will also be, since it is the end of the season, as of next Sunday, when I tape again, on the 1st of October... Next Sunday, we'll also feature the final weekly recap for 2023 for the games that happened because, well, it's going to be over after that. So then the off-season episodes will kick in where I mainly just spew all my thoughts out in the intro to the show like I always do every week in a sort of intro fashion, talk about any news that's happened, any hot discussion of the off-season that's going on, especially hot stove talk, and... Then just do a social media segment. That's really the off-season format that I've been doing for years. And until further notice, it'll continue into this winter and throughout this winter. That's the plan. So we'll do the second-to-last weekly recap after we do the news in just a moment. And then finish off the social media segment. I will not spoil what it is as of yet. For now, though, Yankees news. Not too much happened this past week. In the last bunch of weeks, the news has been filled with crap. Whether it be just general roster moves or more injuries because we know the injuries are absolutely and utterly unending with the Yankees. Or even if it's any sort of other charade that any Yankee player happens to be involved in, which the possibilities this year have been endless. So why don't we start off with the fact that last weekend, at the very end of the weekend, around the time I was done recording, it was announced that Frankie Montas had made a start with the AAA Rail Riders last Sunday, if anyone even gives a damn. Speaking of Frankie Montas, that is a name that's being tossed around a lot as the season comes to a close. People actually asking with a straight face if the Yankees should bring him back, to which I always answer, why the hell would you do that? Even if he goes to another team and returns to the Frankie Montas he was with the A's that was very well respected and at the top of the rotation, fine. Let him. I'm hearing a lot of the same talk about everyone talking about Josh Donaldson going to the playoffs with the Brewers and the fact that he actually had a couple of home runs in his first couple of games there, a couple of big shots. Good for him, whatever. Because guess what? It matters not what happens with the players after they've moved on, if they've done well there. Fact of the matter is, especially if it's a player that it was this obvious for, if it was never going to work out here, it was never going to work out here and they had to go anyway. Let them be successful somewhere else. 
that doesn't have any bearing on what the Yankees were supposed to do with them. It was never going to work out here with Josh Donaldson. It's obviously never going to work out here with Frankie Montas. Never healthy, and when he claimed to be healthy, he was awful. Didn't even pitch for a second this year. Why would you bring that back? So yeah, if anyone gives a damn, he's been having his starts with AAA. Not going to see him this year. There's really no point. So there's that. On Wednesday, it was announced that Jason Dominguez officially underwent his Tommy John surgery. So that's over and done with for Jason. And the anticipated recovery time remains about the same. They're saying 9 to 10 months. As I was talking about last week, I was under the impression that for a position player, especially an outfielder, it would be a bit less. They might just be being careful, or, or that might be the actual recovery time, because the recovery time for pitchers could be as long as a year and a half, and that is significantly less than a year and a half. It's a few months prior to that, so maybe it is going to be that long. But if it is that long, then that still has him being out until at least June. Which, of course, sucks. Very badly. So... Either way, though, surgery's done with, so now he's just on the clock. It's recovery time. Seeing how long it takes, and then when he's ready, how long it takes to ramp back up. And see what role he plays with the Yankees next year. Because this not only really sucks for the Yankees' future in 2024, as he would have been an awesome guy to have around, given how great his first week was. Granted, it was only a week, but hell of a start. This is the most fun we've had this year, I would say other than maybe the perfect game and you know, maybe one or two other things, if anything, seeing Jason Dominguez get off to the start that he was. So not only is it crappy for the team overall, but it's also really crappy that this has to happen to him with an injury that usually pitchers get, and now an outfielder's getting it, just at the age of 20, when he should be right in the middle of his key development time. And now it's throwing a wrench right in the middle of it. So that really sucks in all ways, as we have more than spoken about the last couple of weeks since it was announced that Jason Dominguez would be getting Tommy John surgery. So main thing is, though, is that he's now on the clock. He has gotten the surgery, and there's nothing we can do but wait at this point. It was also announced midweek, and this is actually a positive, believe it or not, that Aaron Judge is up for the Roberto Clemente Award. So go vote for the captain now. I know I will be. He's definitely deserving of it all. I'm still very frustrated that he had to miss significant time this year thanks to a nonsensical cement slab right in front of a bullpen gate in Dodger Stadium. But things are designed the way that they are. It happens. Still not having an awful season for the amount of time that he's played. Average hovering around 270. He's got 35 freaking home runs in only around 100 games, which is really impressive could finish a bit closer to 40 in barely over 100. He's got over 70 RBIs. And actually, can you believe that? There's a good chance this year that no Yankee will even hit 80 RBIs this year. That's insane. It's a little fun fact there. And all the other stats, his OPS is still over 1,000. So even despite being out and missing as much time as he did, he's still not out there playing terribly. Has he hit his slumps? These last few weeks, yeah, he has. I mean, you still have to assume he's not necessarily playing at 100%. So all things considered, just seeing the captain back out there is awesome as it is. It's better than not having him, as long as he's not in any physical danger, obviously. But what's even more awesome than anything is that even despite all that, he's still up for an award. And a very prestigious one at that in the Roberto Clemente Award. Anything having to do with Roberto Clemente is to be respected. So... Go vote for the captain now. I know I will be. I loved seeing this announcement. And it's always great to see him up for all these prestigious awards, like the Roberto Clemente Award, the Hank Aaron Award, things like this. I love that. And lastly in news, because this is really all else that happened, news-wise this past week, not too much, like I said. But before Friday night's game, (laughs) why not add another to the injured list? What's one more? (laughs) Wandy Peralta to the 15-day injured list with a left tricep strain. And in turn, they called up Yoendris Gomez from Double A. And that's basically it for Yankees news from this past week, my good people. And how about I mention this too? 
Why not? Because news did go by quite fast this week. And I'll run over this really quickly again and recap once we go over his latest start. But just a little fun fact, statistics-wise, Michael King, who as we know of late has been trying to be converted to a starter, which certainly can't hurt, especially considering how disheveled this rotation has been with injuries for a lot of the season. Like I said before, it seems like every moment of the season, the rotation saw at least one injury, at least. So Michael King, despite his vast success as a reliever, if he could be successfully converted into a starter, that would be a huge W as far as I'm concerned, a huge win. And he continues to be on a good path with that. Because as of Wednesday, Michael King, in his 28 and a third innings pitched as a starter so far, has a 127 ERA, which is only four earned runs allowed in those 28 and a third innings pitched. 127 ERA with 42 strikeouts in six starts since getting another shot as a starting pitcher of late. Those are crazy numbers. Make of them what you will. Say that they might not have a chance to last. Things could be different next year, especially considering the Yankees are not playing very high-valued games at this point. Use whatever excuse you want. Even amidst all the negativity, I still have to put out the positives out there as long as they're objectively correct, and this is as objective as it gets. Michael King, since getting his latest chance as a starter, has been nothing short of phenomenal. Give credit where credit is due. Michael King deserves his credit. So just a little fun fact statistic out there in news because it has been newsworthy how good of a starter that Michael King has developed into of late. So just a little update there for his starting pitcher progress and seeing how it could very well positively impact the 2024 Yankees if they continue to give him these chances into spring training and if it works out even more so there, possibly even into the 2024 regular season and aiding a fairly damaged rotation up to this point outside of Garrett Cole. And obviously other external changes could be added to that, but that'd be a pretty good start if you could add someone like Michael King as an effective starter. But for now, guys, that's really all in Yankees news. Like I said, not too much. So why don't we keep the ball rolling here and go into weekly recap, discuss what happened this past week. Obviously, the main Yankee opponents, since we last spoke last Sunday, since they wrapped up their series with the Pirates, and badly so, the way that they lost that last game, as we spoke about three games against the Blue Jays, and so far two, today was supposed to be the third, but again, yesterday got rained out, but two games against the Diamondbacks. So really just five games to recap. Let's get to it. Yapping Yankees time machine. Let's go. All right, my friend. So obviously we covered the end of the Yankees and Pirates game back last Sunday. After I hung out some friends for some hours and I came back, the game was over, so we were able to talk about the end of that game. So we jumped to Tuesday since the Yankees had Monday off. They welcomed the Blue Jays to town. And if you remember what I was talking about, there are actually some people out there trying to dilute themselves into thinking that the Yankees could actually possibly defeat the Blue Jays in the vast majority or possibly even all of the remaining matchups that they have against them, which includes these past three games this past week and the upcoming three they have against them this Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And I was saying that they would be lucky, and some others were also saying, that they would be lucky to even win three out of the six. Well, got off to a bad start, of course, because uh, not only did they lose this game, but they lost the series two out of three. So, my prediction is looking more and more legit, especially, you know, what real reason do they even have to try to win instead of just trying to screw up the Blue Jays' playoff chances this coming week since the Yankees are definitively and mathematically out of things now when it comes to the upcoming series at Rogers Center. But anyways, sticking to this one, the Yankees didn't really put up much of a fight in this one, and at the times they did, they really just couldn't push many runs across aside from a first-inning run on a Glaber Torres RBI double that tied the game at one at the time. Otherwise, they lost seven to one. So, offense didn't really do too much. Judge went two for four. Glaber went two for four. One of those hits being that RBI double. IKF had a hit. DJ had a hit. And that was it. Schmidt started the game. Five innings, four runs. Walked two guys, only struck out one. So, not the best of starts for Clark. Took a loss on that. So, he's nine and nine after this start. So, 
a start to forget. Not, you know, an absolute train wreck, but definitely not one that you'd want to remember either. And there were also three runs scored in the top of the ninth inning, as if any more needed to be scored. But why not pour salt in the wound, right? Especially having one of them being unearned thanks to an Anthony Volpe error, but it is what it is. Three more runs scored then, and the Blue Jays ended up taking that one 7-1. to one. Next one on Wednesday wouldn't end up being very competitive either. Michael King would get the start for this one. And you know what? It really is a damn tragedy that he had to take the loss for this one. Because he went seven innings, his longest start, and also in this start, he threw 101 pitches, so he left it all out there, especially for someone just getting a recent shot at being a starting pitcher coming out of the bullpen, so he really left it all out there, giving up five hits, only one run, not walking anyone, and in the seven innings, he struck out 13 guys, 13 strikeouts, so this is maybe... One of probably like three brighter points throughout this past week alongside Garrett Cole's most recent start, really cementing him as the American League Cy Young even more, at least as of now. And also, what we'll get to later, Judge's big home run night, we'll get to it. But this was probably the third. I mean, what a hell of a start for him. The only run that he did allow was a third inning run to the Blue Jays on an infield RBI single by Bo Bichette off Michael King. It was deflected off of him on the mound and bounced towards Volpe. They weren't able to get an out, but that was the only run he allowed all night. And he may have allowed four other hits outside of that, but guys, I mean, that final line, especially for someone who's only just recently become a starter again, seven innings of one run ball, 13 strikeouts. My God. If only the bullpen held things down after him, because Canely, after only getting just two outs, gave up two runs. Ian Hamilton gave up three runs in just an inning. So the bullpen fell apart. And you also factor in the offense did absolutely nothing yet again, not scoring a single run until the bottom of the ninth inning when Austin Wells did hit his first big league home run. So I do want to congratulate Austin Wells on that big accomplishment. But... It's hard to get too happy about that because they were losing in what some people may consider to be an important game, even though people like myself already knew they weren't going to make the playoffs. But while they were still mathematically in it, some may argue that it was still important. And even if you want to, well, fine, it was an important game, and they were losing 6-0. So even by that logic, it's still tough to be happy. But congratulations, I suppose, are still in order for Austin Wells. But outside of that solo shot, guys, they didn't score a single run the whole game, didn't support Michael King amidst his incredible effort. And even back in Yankees news when I gave him his props for how good he's done, this was just yet another start to pile on top of those unbelievable accomplishments he has had since becoming a starter yet again, because he has been nothing short of incredible in doing so. So it really is a damn shame because they didn't score a single run until the bottom of the ninth when they were already down 6 nothing, and he'd only given up that one run in the third inning, which obviously, even if they would have ended up losing one to nothing, and he only gave up that one run and the bullpen didn't fall apart, he still would have taken a loss. Either way, he didn't deserve it, but it's reasons like this why I just have no care whatsoever in my heart for the win-loss stat as a pitcher, especially a starting pitcher in a situation like this. I just have no care in my heart for the win-loss stat. I, I just, I don't. I mean, it's an attractive thing to look at by saying, oh yeah, this pitcher was a 20-game winner, and yeah, I get it, but there are so many other pitching stats you could look at other than that. It's literally the dead last thing I really, really value when evaluating a pitcher. Because you have plenty of outings like this where they do anything but deserve a loss, and yet they get a loss. So, And the Yankees took a bad loss, losing 6-1. to one. So... They went into Thursday at risk of being swept by the Blue Jays, which was really not a surprise to me. But the man they had on the mound, the Yankees, had me feeling a bit confident that they actually could maybe salvage a game because the man was Garrett Cole, going for his 14th win of the season, which ultimately he would get, thanks to yet another incredible effort against a lineup that is not easy. He would end up going eight innings, only allowing two hits, allowing one run, and that one run scored off of a wild pitch, no walks, and striking out nine, lowering his ERA to 275 now, win number 14, which should probably be hovering around 20 now, if not for all the wins he's been robbed of because of the incompetent team around him. And he also reached the 200-inning plateau with at least another start or two to go in this season. Still, 217 strikeouts now. This man, 
as long as his last start or two does not go disastrously wrong, is your American League Cy Young Award winner, guys. And this further cemented it, a fantastic effort by the Yankee ace. I mean, what else could be said? Got a little nerve-wracking at the end when, when Clay Holmes, as always, made things interesting in the ninth inning, even though it wasn't helped at all by a Glaber Torres throwing error that DJ LeMay, you could not scoop out of the dirt. But Clay Holmes has had a habit of making a lot of games interesting in the second half in his ninth inning works. But the offense also got out to an early start. Other than this, they didn't really do much of anything, but it was good to get off to this early start. Jake Bowers, believe it or not, the planets were able to perfectly align and allow Jake Bowers to actually make contact with a baseball and have just about any other outcome other than striking out. <laughs> so he actually got a hold of one by Jose Barrios, a two-seamer inside, and he took care of it, golfing it into deep second-deck right field territory. A three-run shot putting the Yankees up 3 nothing. like I said. Planets aligning or not, it is a miracle that we actually got to see Jake Bowers make contact for once. Once upon a time, this guy was hitting home runs like there was no tomorrow. And then another time, all the way up until now, he could not even hope to touch the baseball with the baseball bat. So now, this was pretty incredible to see that he was actually responsible for three big Yankee runs. And they would add on in the bottom of the sixth on an RBI double by Estevan Florial, and then an RBI double by Aaron Judge in the bottom of the seven. Things were looking pretty definitive at this point. And like I said, other than that wild pitch, and then the Blue Jays make it an interesting off of Clay Holmes in the ninth inning, the Yankees would seal a 5-3 to three victory and give Garrett Cole his much-deserved 14th victory, and we all know that should be much higher. And the last one before today's game that we have to go over really is Friday night's game when the Yankees welcomed the Diamondbacks into the town, who were, of course, in a playoff race of their own. In the National League wildcard picture, they currently possess the second wild card, only a half a game above the third wild card, Chicago Cubs, who are only a game above the Miami Marlins, who are chasing them both. So the National League wild card picture, like the American League one, at least as of the three wild cards, is very interesting. I would say it's more interesting in the National League because they have four teams outside of the third wild card that are within five games. And then you also have the Diamondbacks and Cubs within a half a game of each other for the second wild card. And only four and a half games above the Diamondbacks are the Phillies in the first wild card. In the American League, the only team that's still in it as of now is the Mariners outside of the actual wild card teams right behind the Astros. And then you have the Astros, two games over them, the Blue Jays. So Good battle going on for the second one as well, but more teams are still in it outside of the third wild card in the National League. So both sides have their interesting scenarios going on about them right now. But either way, still, the Diamondbacks, I would say, have a lot more to fight for right now than the Yankees do. But the first night was still a lot of fun because remember before I was saying Judge had a big home run night? Well, this one was the one. Your boy had three home runs for the second time this year. It may have sounded familiar, Judge having a three-homer night. Well, you'd be correct, because this was the second time this year that this happened. That's right. Despite all the time he's missed, these three home runs propelled Aaron Judge to 35 home runs on the season, guys. 35. And just in case people out there, because of all the time he has unfortunately missed, have lost track of how many games he's played in this year... Well, he's only played in 101, and he's got 35 home runs. That's a pretty damn good pacing, and this game definitely helped him along, no doubt about it. The starting pitching decision really made no sense as to why they went with him over plenty of other young kids who could have made the start and further cemented some more experience into their young careers, but Luke Weaver got the start, actually didn't do a bad job at all. Five and a third, four hits, no runs, no walks, and three strikeouts, so did not have a bad start by any means. Gotta give him credit, but... Still think the Yankees could have really gone with anybody else. Johnny Brito, even though the Yankees won by the score they did, would still earn a save because if you pitch at least the final three-plus innings, you'll still earn a save. He did that, and then some three and two-thirds, only allowing a run, not walking anyone and striking out three. His control has been better a lot more than it has not been since, of course, he had the 
train wreck of an outing against the Twins earlier on in the year, and then he had a lot of control and command issues after that. Well, we've been talking about how out of the bullpen he's had a lot of long outings where his command has definitely been a lot better, and this is another example of that, taking really the almost the entire back end of the game and holding things down while the Yankee offense, mostly consisting of Aaron Judge, did their thing. <laughs> he would actually start off the scoring in the bottom of the third with his 33rd home run of the year being a three-run shot to center field. So that made it 3-0. Estevan Florial, the only other run scored by the Yankee offense other than Aaron Judge, had an RBI double in the bottom of the fifth, made it 4-0. Aaron Judge then with his 34th of the year, right center field, two-run shot, made it 6 nothing, and then in the bottom of the seventh with a solo shot, his 35th and most recent of the season, made it 7 nothing. Another ball to right field. So center field, right center, right field. So either straightaway center or the other way. That's how you love to see it with Judge. All these years we've had the privilege of watching him. He always hits it to all fields, and a lot of the time we see him hit the other way. And we saw a lot of that with this three-homer game. Again, his second this season, so that is awesome. So that was a big bright spot here. Weaver had himself a nice start. Brito held it down. Aaron Judge being six of the seven runs, the other being from Estevan Florial. Yankees get a nice 7-1 to one win against a team that has a lot to lose. So again, that's, that's a big positive. When you can play hard against teams who are in it, possibly throw a monkey wrench into their plans, why not? Yesterday, again, got rained out. That is the game that's going to be played tomorrow, which is what otherwise was an off day prior. But today's game, really nothing happens. As a matter of fact, it was the same score that was on Friday, except it was just on the other foot this time. The Diamondbacks won this one 7-1. So that's pretty crazy. Yankees win 7-1 Friday. Diamondbacks win 7-1 today. Rodon got the start today, and he went 6 and a third, allowing five runs, only three earned. One walk and four strikeouts, so again, not necessarily Rodon's best, and he partially has a Floreal error to thank for that, some shaky defense in the outfield today, but not really surprised. <laughs> you know, it's the, the outfield, some that they neglected this past winter and was a pretty big problem for the vast majority of the season, who could have predicted it, and otherwise he just wasn't really 100% sharp necessarily, like he has rarely been since coming back from missing a big chunk of the season with his many injuries, whether it be his elbow problem to start or his chronic back problem or even the hamstring problem he had for a little bit. Regardless, uh, he has seldom been the road Don that we know he could be and should be. So he would unfortunately end up taking an L for this effort as well. 3-7, and seven, ERA up to 574. Definitely not ideal or what anybody signed up for. Randy Vasquez came in afterwards and unfortunately made a bit of a mess of things himself. In just two and a third, he allowed two runs himself, walked two guys, and McAllister finished it off, getting one out for the remainder of the Yankee pitching. And other than an Aaron Judge bases-loaded walk in the bottom of the ninth, that is all she wrote because that would be the final, as I said before. Diamondbacks 7, Yankees 1. And as for what's coming up for the rest of the week... For the rest of the season, I should say, because this is the final week. And by next Sunday, they will have played their final game, because that is when the final game is. Starting with tomorrow, which was, again, supposed to be an off day for the Yankees. And it was an interesting setup with Diamondbacks as well, because the Diamondbacks were supposed to start a series against the White Sox tomorrow, and the Yankees were supposed to be off. But now, since this is the last week, and they can't really push things into the following week because of the wild card rounds, they have to fit this game in at some point. So they literally had to have the Yankees and Diamondbacks play the last game at Yankee Stadium tomorrow afternoon and move what was supposed to be the first game of the Diamondbacks and White Sox series to Thursday. <laughs> so the whole situation is a big mess. <laughs> So, the Yankees are playing tomorrow, after all, at 1.05 Eastern because of Saturday's postponement. Clark Schmidt will be on the mound for the Yankees. Then, on Tuesday, they hit the road for their second-to-last series of the season, as tomorrow is their final home game of the season. They'll go to Toronto, to Rogers Center, 
No pitcher announced for the Yankees as of yet for this one, but they'll be facing Kevin Gossman. That game will be at 7.07 Eastern, as will Wednesdays. Barrios will be taking the mound for the Blue Jays on that day. 7.07 start, and also a 7.07 start on Thursday, the 28th. Bassett will be on the mound for the Blue Jays. Again, no pitcher announced for the Yankees as of now. And then Friday through Sunday, the 29th through to October 1st, will be the final series of the 2023 season for the New York Yankees. Kansas City, Kauffman Stadium, one of my personal favorites because of how nice it is. First game will be at 8-10 Eastern on Friday night. Saturday night will be 7-10 Eastern and Sunday, the final day of the season. Like every single game will be, the Yankees game will also be at 3 o'clock, well, 3-10 specific Eastern. Every single game around the league is in or starting in the first part of the 3 o'clock hour as they do for every year for the 162nd and final game of the regular season. Yankees and Royals in Kansas City, 3-10 Eastern, game 162, and then that is it. Because then two days later, on Tuesday the 3rd, begin the wild card rounds. And again, that's why they couldn't really push anything to the following week if there were any rainouts this weekend, because it starts right away. Got to get right to it. So that's what's ahead, guys. And then the season's over. After that, well, next week is the final regular season 2023 Yapping Yankees edition. It's off-season content after that, baby. Well, it'll still be the playoffs, but the Yankees aren't a part of it. So as far as the Yankees are concerned, it'll be off-season content. I'll, of course, be keeping track of the playoffs and what every team does and who ends up winning the World Series, as I do every year. Because at the end of the day, while the Yankees come first, I'm also a diehard baseball fan. So I will also be very closely following the playoffs, as I do Every year, even though it would obviously be even closer if my team were in it. But this year, we were basically allowed to have little to no nice things at all, as we well know. So there's that. Why don't we wrap up with the social media segment, guys? We're actually making really good timing today. Only about 50 minutes in. Let's keep the ball rolling. Why not? So this week, I figured before the final week of the season, because I'll definitely have a question for you prepared for next weekend, for the season officially being over, But I figured I'd give you guys the floor again one last time for at least the 2023 season and do a Q&A. See what's on your minds. So you guys ask, I answer. And I'll do a few questions before wrapping up today. Let's see what we can start with here. I assume there are definitely going to be a lot of thoughts on everyone's minds. Let's see. Let's start first with my good friend Rebecca at Peace Now for Life saying, Hey Mike, what is one change you would make to next year's roster? One addition or subtraction? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question, Rebecca. One change I'd make. Well, you see, that's tough because the Yankees need multiple to improve. You could say that they could add the Yamamoto kid from Japan who's going to be posted to the major leagues this offseason who the Yankees and many others will be into to add to the starting rotation because of all the injury problems and question marks that they have had because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, well, Nestor will be back next year and even if you don't bring back Seve, you could have Michael King in there and Clark Schmidt. Well, Schmidt started off the season a certain way even though he pitched the rest of it A lot better, if I had to say, on the whole. Still had his difficult starts, but on the whole, he was far better than the beginning of the year. I don't think that's up for debate. He made me eat my words a lot of the time, gladly. But that's not a sure thing, and you're probably not going to get the absolute best of starting pitching out of him. Michael King is still transitioning over, even though he's looked absolutely terrific, but that would be great if it ended up working out for good going forward. Obviously, Carlos Rodon is a huge question mark, both health and performance-wise, after what we've witnessed in 2023. So who knows what's going to happen there. Everyone's saying, oh, Nestor's going to be back. Well, Nestor missed the vast majority of this year. So it could be possible that he could be hurt a great deal next year too. It's not a guarantee he'll be healthy all throughout. So there are a lot of question marks in this rotation. So you could add Yamamoto to have some reassurance of that. But even he's not a sure thing. He's just coming over here and he could have a tough adjustment. Who knows? I hear he's got a lot of great stuff. Brian Cashman and others went there themselves to personally see him pitch in Japan. So... The Yankees are in on him, a lot of others are in on him, and they could use him as an addition, even though it's not a sure thing as he's transitioning to the States. But you could use that, and the Yankees could also make an addition with a bat, which is really what they need at the end of the day, because the biggest problem of this year, even though, yeah, the pitching was a little bit unsure starting-wise, the bullpen was still amongst the best in the league, but 
I don't think anybody would argue the fact that the main issue with the Yankees, the main, main problem was the offense. An absolute and utter disgrace the vast majority of nights throughout the entire year. So you could solve this with a guy like Bellinger, or you could solve this by making any sort of a trade by adding an outfielder. I think that's definitely a top priority. And who you trade is up to you. I know a lot of people are talking about trading Glaber still. I just don't think that's a very good idea right now because of how he's proven himself, especially offensively. I'm the first one to admit that his mental mistakes on the field frustrate me as much as the next guy. But as someone who was basically the most reliable and consistent Yankees hitter on this team throughout this entire year, and the Yankees had virtually none, especially throughout the time that Judge was out, I just think it's tough to trade a guy like that. Yeah, it's probably the one who could give you the biggest return, but on a team that's already offense-starved the vast majority of the time, you want to get rid of one of their better bats? Possibly their best bat, as of this year at least? That's not so easy for me to pull the trigger on at this time. So, I don't know, just one addition or subtraction, that's that's a lot. Because the Yankees need to do a lot of work. They have a lot of work to do. I guess right now, when it comes to pitching, I guess you could start looking at Yamamoto if that's the one. I guess I'll say that is the one. But I would also say the one would be a bat. I'll put the bats actually first because the bats are a bigger priority. That was the vast majority of the problem this year, and that's what really sunk them in the playoffs in 2022 as well. So this is a problem that dates back quite a bit. So whether it be Bellinger or somebody else, obviously Shohei Otani is going to be out there too, even though his circumstances have changed since he's gotten surgery and he's not going to pitch until 2025 and it could maybe possibly at least slightly compromise his offense a little bit, so his value is naturally going to decrease at least a little bit. And of course, he's also expressed his lack of desire to play on the East Coast. So there's that as well. There were a lot of people who like to float the idea around of trading for Juan Soto, which of course is an interest of mine because I happen to really like Soto, so you could think about that. Just plenty of different names to throw around that we could have all winter to talk about. So a lot of potential alternatives that could take place in the winter. So it's tough to just put just one, but in general, I'll just say a bat first and foremost, because the offense is the main issue, of course. At Kane's Eagles 1 asks, any chance of Boone being fired? Change is needed. Well, thank you, good sir, for the question. Being fired, I mean, it's a chance, I mean, because it's a failure of a season and maybe just to make themselves look good and just for the sake of change, he could be fired. But I've spoken about what I think of that many times. Even if he is, and he is the only one to go, I don't see very much changing. I think you need to can Cashman or maybe just move him around and hire someone else's GM and shift around the front office as a whole a bit because I think that's really the only way that true change could be implemented in this organization. That's really it. Really shifting things around with the actual part of the team that's responsible for constructing this mess. So that's really what I think about that. So if Boone is fired, which I think there's a chance that it could be because the Yankee fans are going to be crying out all winter for any sort of change to be made, not that they're going to go by fully what the fans say, but if they do subscribe to that, making change for the sake of change amidst having a horrible season that was pitifully under expectations, maybe you do something like fire Aaron Boone. But do I think it really changes anything? I mean, maybe slightly, but... It's really not going to do anything to the scale of what some people might think it will. It won't. And it might even mess with the players a little bit because the players are constantly on record. I mean, I guess what else are they going to say to a degree? But they're also constantly on record saying that they like the guy. So I just don't think it's going to create even half the change that people think it would. Any chance? Yeah, because the Yankees had that pitiful of a season. There's a chance that it could be done just for the sake of change. Sure. Could be. I don't think it will be, but it could be. Tina at Mountain Gal 456 asks, Do you think we'll have a strong pitching rotation next season, and do you think they'll lean towards playing Stanton more as a DH? Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you for the question, Tina. Um, Strong pitching rotation? I mean, honestly, it depends whether or not they acquire this Yamamoto guy. Without him, I think there's still a lot of question marks. Because Michael King, while he's still trying to become a starter again here, 
you know, he doesn't have a whole entire season's worth of starting under him. You know, his arm's going to have to adjust to that. He might not be able to throw as many innings as your average starter. Like, they might cut him off around 150 innings or so. So you have that. And who guarantees that he's healthy throughout all of that? Michael King's been hurt before. Clark Schmidt, I don't think he really has what it takes to be an absolutely dominant starter. I mean, he'll give you good stuff. Maybe have an ERA in the low fours, high threes at best, I would say. So, I wouldn't really call that strong. I wouldn't call it bad. I wouldn't call it strong, by any means. Nestor, there's no guarantees with because of how much of this season he spent injured. I mean, who knows? Maybe he could bounce back in 2024. That'd be awesome. And the rotation could certainly use it. I don't see Severino coming back. I definitely don't think he should be given another chance. Even if the Yankees really need another arm out there, I just don't think he's the guy. Can't stay healthy for the life of him and really prove that his stuff isn't even really that that great anymore this year either, especially his fastball. Doesn't have the life that it used to. So it's really... I don't really know what else you're guaranteeing to be a strong rotation if you don't acquire Yamamoto, who will also have to adjust to the States a bit. I mean, people have to adjust to him too, so it goes the other way as well. But there's not a guarantee that he'll really take to the States very well. It's not a guarantee. It never is. And of course, Rodon is Rodon. How much time he spent injured and what we've seen of him since coming back, I mean, (laughs) that's not a guarantee. So really the only sure thing, and you know, what really is a sure thing in life when you think about it, but not to get all philosophical, but the surest thing in the rotation is really just Garrett Cole. And guess what? Even he is not getting much younger, even though he's on the verge of winning a Cy Young Award, and deservedly so, He's not getting any younger. So, too many question marks, as I've said, Tina, to really say that they will have a strong rotation, especially if they stay idle with it and do not acquire Yamamoto from Japan, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. So, I can't really say that. I don't think they'll really have a very strong rotation unless they act, because a lot of it is question marks. A lot of it. Strong question marks, not just your average question marks. Stanton DHing. I mean, no matter what they do with Stanton, it doesn't matter. DHing or outfield, he can't do what he did this year. That's that's a fact. <laughs> that is a fact. Because this year, what you want to talk about a disgrace. And this is coming from a Stanton defender, by the way. A lot of you know that I like Stanton, but I am very unhappy with him with the season that he had. I am disgusted by it. So, I don't really care if they use him more as a DH or if they use him more as an outfielder if they need him to do that and fulfill that role until they make another move or or what have you. Regardless of what they have him do, the offense cannot be what it was in 2023. So will they probably use him as DH more? I I guess. I don't really know. Because there are times where they put him in the outfield quite a lot, so I don't really think they know what they want to do with him at times. But regardless, my answer to that question is the bat just has to be different. Far better than it was this year. This is a guy who has been known, especially in the playoffs, at times to put an entire team on his back. And he has the potential to do so and is expected to do so, especially in the eyes of many with the contract that he has. This year, he did anything but. Even when he came back from injury, a lot of people were hyped, especially myself, because, you know, Aaron Judge was out and the team's offense was really doing nothing. I was saying, you know what? Stanton has proven a lot in the past to put a team on his back and really carry them when he's really needed. And he has done it before. He's done it before at the Yankees multiple times, whether it be in the regular season or the playoffs, especially the playoffs. But this year, it just didn't get done. That and the whole charade with his running... I, it's just a mess. I mean, the way he got thrown out of the plate a bunch of weeks ago, I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. So the running or the lack thereof and just the complete disappearance of offensive production, it just can't happen. It can not happen again. Next, at Yankee Ken asks, what do you want to see from Anthony Volpe next season? The main thing I want to see is just, you know, him continuing to develop and get experience. His rookie season is out of the way. Just keep learning, keep developing, keep gaining experience. And with experience comes the confidence and the production. 
one main thing I would really like to see him change is his two-strike approach. I mean, yeah, we've all gotten on him at times this season for his swing being so big and, and, you know, so long. But the main thing I also notice is that, like, when there's a two-strike count, his swing is just as long or even longer as prior in the at-bat. He doesn't protect, really. He just he just goes for it. He should, I think he would benefit greatly by shortening up his swing, maybe even choking up a bit and getting a little bit more protective in a two-strike count come next year. I think he should start to do that a bit more. I really do. I think you'd see the strikeouts go down. I think you'd see the on-base percentage go up, which is needed. I mean, the RBIs and especially the home runs and even the stolen bases, even though it should have been a lot more stolen bases given the start he got off to with them. I mean, those stats, certain things for his rookie year, he did very well. But there are other stats like OPS and average and many other offensive stats that he had that were (laughs) not good. Not good. WRC plus, OPS plus on the whole. There's room for improvement. But that's what you often say with rookies. Not many get off to legendary starts in their very first looks in the big leagues. That does not happen often at all. So that's really it, just continuing to learn and gain experience and just maintain that glove at short too. Obviously, he's made his errors like anybody would, but on the whole, that glove has been been really good. Some people judge the throwing arm at times, but he's also had a lot of good plays where the arm looks good. So just continue to build at shortstop from the good foundation he already has and really change the hitting approach. That's the main thing I'd like to see changed because I think a lot of his negative offensive stats would change for the better if he did that. Get a little bit more protective. Shorten up. Choke up on two strikes maybe. Focus more on putting the bat on the ball rather than having such a long, aggressive swing when not needed. So those are some thoughts I guess I would throw around for Anthony Volpe. At CZ October 25 asks, On opening day, who was our left fielder, center fielder, and third baseman, and 3-4-5 starting pitcher? Well, 3-4-5 starting pitcher mainly depends on whether or not they go after Yamamoto. So I'd probably do, like, if they did get him, maybe like Cole, Rodon slash Yamamoto for two or three, flip-flop those. Then maybe for four, I guess Nestor, if he's going to be back in the rotation, and five, Michael King. If anything goes wrong injury-wise, then you also have someone like Schmidt there. I mean, if he's back and ready to go, if the Yankees still even have him, Domingo Herman will be around again. I mean, but that's really up in the air right now, nor do I really care to see him back, honestly, on the field. I, of course, hope that he's getting the help he needs off the field, but on the field, I don't really care to see him pitch again. So you have other options if they don't get Yamamoto, but I, I guess if they don't, because that's a scenario if they do. If they don't, I guess it's got to be Cole, Rodon, Nestor, King, Schmidt, or Schmidt, King. You also have Johnny Brito, who can maybe open up a game or pitch a few innings to start if you need him to. Randy Vasquez is around. So there's a bunch of different options, but I guess those are the mains, including the 3, 4, 5 like you asked for. So it depends what they do with Yamamoto or maybe any other pitcher they choose to acquire. Who knows? But Yamamoto is the main one they seem to be talking about. Left fielder, center fielder, and third baseman. I mean, they could continue to mainly keep playing Peraza there and also keep Oswaldo Cabrera, who showed some encouraging signs of turning things around late here as opposed to his horrendous start this year. I mean, he could do either third base or left field, really. So either one of those two could be Cabrera. The other could be Oswald Peraza if you want him to continue to develop, which I think would not be a bad idea at all. Or otherwise, at third base, I guess you're going to have to have DJ there. Hopefully, DJ continues to show a bit of signs of turning around like he did a bit in the second half. Because for most of the season, of course, it was pitiful to watch him decline as he heads into his mid-30s. So, I guess it'll either be like Peraza or DJ at third. Or Cabrera. You know, it depends who they're switching around those given days. Center field, that's an interesting one because they could acquire Cody Bellinger. Or then when Dominguez comes back, Dominguez will be the one. Or you could keep Estevan Floreal up for the time being. It just depends. There's a lot up in the air right now. There's a lot, a lot up in the air. 
I know the Yankees are pushing Spencer Jones through the system. I'm not expecting to really see him too soon. But that's another outfield option. So, I don't know. There's, there's a bunch of guys. A bunch of names. So, on opening day, it's it's really up in the air right now, my man. It's, it's going to have to become clear as time moves along. But those are some names to throw out there, I suppose as what the Yankees have right now and possibly what they could do. Let's go to Spencer at Musician DMD, writing, I write this still in the wake of my disbelief that I was in attendance for Judge's three-home run game on Friday night. Awesome, Spencer. It's really nice. The accomplishment and the win momentarily had me overlook the totality of the struggles of the Yankees this season. One thing you and I have differing views on is the team finishing at 500. For me, it isn't about continuing the streak as much as it is that a 500 record, by definition, is a winning season, and at minimum, I want 2023 to be a winning season. I also don't want reaching 500 needing to be a goal of 2024. Thoughts on this? Well, thank you for the question, Spencer. Yeah, I don't know. Listen... I just view this season as anything but a winning one for the way it was played for the vast majority throughout. So I guess I just don't really care also for the vast majority of the reason that I don't think the Yankees deserve to have their record reflect a winning season based on how they've played. I don't think they deserve it. So yeah, I'm not going to say I'm going to be pissed off if they get a 500 record. I'll be, I guess I'll feel indifferent about it, not pissed off. But I, I just don't really care as much. It's not that I don't want it to happen. I'm just not as invested in it happening as long as the playoffs aren't even happening and they have this little to look forward to with all the crap that's happened. So, respectfully, I don't even want to fully disagree because I'm not going to be pissed if they finish over 500. I just don't really care. So, not necessarily a disagreement, just an indifference, I guess. But yeah, you were there for Judge's three home run game. That's, that's epic, man. I don't know how many people know this. I've definitely mentioned this on the show before, but I was there for his 495-foot shot back in 2017. little fun fact for those who didn't know that. But yeah, listen, any little moments that could help you forget how horrific this season's been, well, just relish in them, man. I mean, anything to escape from it, right? <laughs> just forget about it even for just five minutes. It's worth it sometimes. But yeah, I guess, listen, that's my that's my opinion for... 500. I definitely don't want them to be anywhere near this position for 2024, though. That's for sure. Absolutely. It's just in a situation like this, I mean, if if finishing over 500 meant them making the playoffs, I'd obviously, I'd be so much more invested in it, but they're not fighting for anything right now. They're really not. Yeah, it would keep the streak going, but with a season as pitiful as this one, do you really think they deserve it? I mean, if they do it, they do it, but really, for what they've caused this year, do do they really deserve to finish over 500 and should anybody really like strongly care about it? I just don't. Personally, I really don't given the fact that it's basically done now. I did see one person write to me on social media earlier, literally just like 10 minutes ago saying, "Oh, the Yankees aren't 100% out of it yet." I mean, everybody's been saying they're eliminated from the playoffs and I saw it in the standings, but right here even on the MLB app it says one, where it says wild card elimination, it says one. So that, it doesn't have an E next to it. So, I don't know, the MLB app is saying that they still have one game left to go before elimination, but, I mean, I thought mathematically they were out of it. I mean, everybody else is going around. I'm even looking around Twitter right now. Everybody's saying they're out of it, they're out of it, so I don't know. It's really weird. I mean, even if they aren't definitively out of it right now, man, I mean, Really, that means they would have to go completely undefeated going forward. They're going to lose at least one game to the Blue Jays and possibly even tomorrow to the Diamondbacks, guys. It's not happening. So, they're out of it. (laughs) The mentality of chill out because this next week is meaningless still applies. I don't really care. But the 500 mentality, yeah, I guess I'm just indifferent towards it now. But yeah, I don't want to have to have any concerns about that next year. That's for sure, Spencer. No doubt. All right, let's continue on. Who else is there? At B. Welch 1943 asks, Expecting five Yankees to be gone. Decide who they most likely will be, not who you'd prefer. Then suggest how you would refurbish the 26-man roster. One trade and one free agent limit. See, these are such tough things to really ponder. Because it's still just like mid to late September, the season's not even really over yet, and there's so much to consider, so many question marks going into the winter, so it's tough to say. 
five Yankees to be gone. I definitely think that guys like Severino and Montas, people you absolutely cannot rely on to be healthy or to be efficient. I mean, those guys will be gone, especially expiring contracts like that. You would have asked me this a few weeks ago. I probably would have also said that Bader would have been gone. He's already gone, of course. Donaldson and Hicks were already dumped off, so that takes us to five already, but I guess going forward, you're meaning. So Seve and Montas, definitely. That's a good start for two guys. I also think Wandy Peralta is up this offseason, so they'll probably let him walk. So I don't know. I'd have to look into this deeper. I haven't really done my due diligence with this yet because the offseason hasn't even officially started. But yeah, definitely names like that I think the Yankees will let walk, and they probably should. I mean, Wandy's had mostly good times here, but he's also had his injury troubles. I mean, throughout most of the year, I feel like you always hear the Yankees say, oh yeah, Wandy's dealing with this or dealing with that, and I don't know. So the bullpen's already strong enough as it is, and they could bolster it up even more if they want, although I definitely think it is the lowest priority of all the things they have to fix. So I guess those are a few names out there. Definitely Montas and Seve more so than anybody, I think, should just be let go. Let them walk. Then suggest how you would refurbish the 26-man roster. Well, a lot of it would be the same as of now, the way that it is. Maybe just making some bullpen changes, like guys like Zach McAllister and Nick Ramirez and guys like that. You know, Luke Weaver. These are guys that you're probably not going to see again. If you do, I'll be pretty surprised. They just really don't have much of a role here, to be honest. Not one that I desire or care for anyway. Uh, You could see guys like Kyle Higashioka go as well, so that's another one. But, yeah, other than that, it's it's tough to really answer this because it really hasn't even ended yet, and you don't know if if in this last week or so somebody will sustain another major injury. So I'd like to revisit this when we get to official off-season discussion. But I guess these are some names out there because the 26 man is kind of all over the place right now because of injuries and a lot of unsure factors and it could be different by the time next season begins. Like Trevino will be back from injury as well. Possibly see other bullpen guys come back like Efros, for instance. So it's, we'll see. It just, a lot of it depends and a lot of it could change by the time next season starts. But we'll, we'll get to all of it this winter, of course. One trade and one free agent limit. Well, one free agent limit, I guess that would limit you to either get someone like Bellinger to help out the offense or someone like Yamamoto to help out the pitching. So that stinks that there's a limit to that. But trades, I mean, we'll have to conjure all this up in the offseason. Tough. That's one thing for sure, though. Of all the questions I'm getting right now saying, oh, just one of this or one of that when it comes to the Yankees, the Yankees are going to need a hell of a lot more than that in multiple areas. That's the complication. All right, as we close in on the one hour and 20 minute mark, why don't we finish off with the usual final two as always. Thank you all so much for the questions so far up to this point. Second to last, as always, we have my girlfriend at Vic Salimo, and she asks, has the way this season has gone affected your passion for baseball? Why or why not? And what do you wish to see going forward for the sport or Yankees that you feel is lacking from past times that made you love baseball in the first place? It has absolutely not affected my passion for baseball. Absolutely not. Even though I'll sit here and be as hard on the Yankees as I am when they do badly, I mean, that's part of the reason I'm a ride or die. And part of what makes me a ride or die. Because even when they drive me this insane, I'm still along for the ride, at least mostly. I might prioritize some other things I have to do throughout my day a little bit more when they're playing meaningless games, but I'll still be along for the ride. And I will never abandon them, and I'll never let it affect my passion. Ever. I love the game that much. I love the Yankees that much. So definitely not. It has not negatively affected my passion. I'm not going anywhere. If anything, there are just certain changes to the sport itself in recent years that have maybe ticked me off a bit, but hey, still around, not going anywhere. I'm not going to sit around here and pretend like I'm going to stop watching the game anytime soon unless things just get completely and utterly out of control beyond belief. But as of now, no, it hasn't affected my passion. I'm certainly not going anywhere. Definitely don't got to worry about that. But when it comes to the Yankees and the changes they could make to make me a happier fan, well, (laughs) I mean, we have definitely been through some and we'll continue to go through them all winter. (laughs) Lord knows we've got the time. 
Last but certainly not least, as always, is my mom, Julie Gina Scudero, asking, My question to you is, do you think Cole's performance pitching eight solid innings last time out could make him a shoe-in as if he wasn't already for the Cy Young Award? And do you think another good two starting pitchers being added would benefit the Yankees in making a massive front along with Cole? Against all starts, against teams they face going forward, I definitely do. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you for the question, Mom. And thank you for the question, Vic, and the rest of you as well. Really appreciate it. Uh, Yeah, the last start definitely cemented things even further as far as I'm concerned, like I said before, for sure. Two more starters, I mean, yeah, the rotation is as big of a question as it is, but I doubt the Yankees are going to be able to add two starters and, after that, make some very necessary offensive additions as well because they're only going to do so much. So I'd say one starting addition at best and then maybe a decent amount of help with the hitting, which is really what they need to stop neglecting. But that one piece of help could definitely be the guy from Japan. Who knows? Yamamoto. We'll see what happens. Or they could look at other targets. We'll see. We have plenty of time to go through all the names, as I mentioned, a lot of offensive names before. Definitely can't hurt, though. I mean, I've said that the offense is their main problem, but adding more pitching definitely never hurts, especially if it's a front-end guy. So... We'll see what they decide with that, but it definitely wouldn't hurt their chances making more starting additions, but I definitely think the attention mostly has to be with the offense. It just has to be. There's enough ignoring that this is the problem, the main problem right now, and it has been for some time, and it does them no good to neglect it any further. And with that, despite how much I wish I could neglect this fact because of how much fun I have every week on this show, guys, that is... All for episode 196 of Yapping Yankees today, as much as I wish I could continue. But regardless, like I always do before my outro spiel, I want to thank each and every one of you for submitting your questions. I think we did about 10 questions today. That is good enough for now. I'm sorry if I didn't get to yours, but if you just keep on trying with the social media segment every week, like I always say, guys, just keep on leaving them. I'm going to get to you eventually. I will. But just because I don't get to your reply or question or whatever it happens to be, On a given week, that doesn't mean I appreciate you any less. Still love each and every one of you for listening, for interacting, the whole nine yards, guys. Thanks so much. But in the meantime, please do remember to follow me on all social medias if you don't already. Facebook fan page, Mike Scudero NY. My Twitter is at Mike Scudero. And Instagram is Mike Scuds 97. Subscribe to Yapping Yankees on all four of the platforms it is available on. That's YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Leave a like on all of them and just show your love like you always do such a great job at doing, my friends. And if you've missed any Yapping Yankees episodes, well, do not fret. You can listen to episodes 34 up to today's episode 196 on YouTube and every single Yapping Yankees episode ever. Going back to the first episode over four years ago. All the way up to today, those can all be found on Apple, Spotify, and SoundCloud. But once again, thank you 3000 for listening to me yap today as always, my good friends. I have been your host, Mike Scudero, and I will talk to you next Sunday, the first day of October. Another new month. The last regular season edition of Yapping Yankees episode in 2023. When I come at you with episode 197, we're inching closer to 200, guys. Absolutely insane. But until then, as always, hang in there, be patient, stay safe, look out for your loved ones. Regardless of whether or not the season is over for the Yankees, still, there is no excuse to not go out there and kick life's ass this week, my friend. So go ahead and do so. And other than that... I guess all we have left to do as Yankee fans is just enjoy this last week as much as we can, despite the fact that it'll probably continue to contain a good amount of pain, just like most weeks have consisted of (laughs) throughout the vast majority of this season. So now that the games really don't count or mean anything for the rest of this season, for this last week, let's just uh, go along for the ride, I guess, right? It's all we can really do for the rest of this season and take it from there as we move into the offseason. Really not much else to say, but that will meet again to yap some more next Sunday. So I'll talk to you then, my friends. Take care, and let's go Yanks. Yanks.